Hi guys and welcome to the show. You join me here in the beautiful, historic and very important American city of Philadelphia. Uh, it looks a bit like New York but it's uh, so different and uh, I've decided to come here for an extended weekend, do a little bit of exploration and of course before I uh, get into talking about watches and having a look around and sharing it with you guys I'll do my wristwatch check before I completely forget. Actually I should mention I, I came here with three watches, my G-Shock for the gym, my Rolex Submariner because uh, as you guys know I've travelled extensively with that watch so I wanted to add another notch uh, so to speak to that watch's achievements and of course my latest acquisition which I have on me right now it is the Fortis Cosmonaut um, I'm still kind of pinching myself that I found this bargain the wonders of the Japanese used watch market yeah the gamble paid off if you want to find out a little bit more about it have a look back in the previous video um, but uh, first, let's have a look around this uh, beautiful place. A little bit of background on Philadelphia itself. Philadelphia is hugely integral to the history of the United States. It served as the nation's first capital. What we're looking at now is Independence Hall, where the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution was signed. Surrounding it are many equally as important and beautiful buildings dating back uh, from this period. And probably most iconic of all is the Liberty Bell, which once was um, in the clock tower, or bell tower, I should say, of Independence Hall, uh, now preserved in its own dedicated building. Greatly symbolic of uh, American freedom and immortalized as the iconic symbol of American independence. In the surrounding areas, it's just absolutely chock-a-block, over 300 years of architectural styles from ultra-modern to classic, very uh, British-influenced uh, Greco and uh, Roman revivalism. We have Art Deco, uh, turn of the century, and I love the way they contrast off each other. Probably one of the most impressive buildings is the current City Hall, which was constructed in 1871. Upon the watchtower is a statue of William Penn, the city's original founder. This majestic landmark uh, very much is a central point in which the city is uh, built around. And there I am uh, doing a wrist shot. Uh, I was Schwartz coughing on that particular moment and just as I imagined uh, I do look rather odd taking a picture of my wrist raised like that but anyway uh, I'm sure we're all guilty of it but it's not just uh, palatial grandeur and extravagance there are some quaint adorable little streets in fact this one here Elfthrift's Alley the nation's oldest residential street uh, there are lots of little hidden alleyways little hidden courtyards in amongst the the modern construction around it uh, and there is a ton of memorials um, here we see a memorial to those that fell in the Revolutionary War in Washington Square in the tomb of the unknown soldier with an eternal flame burning uh, very moving the park is actually built on a burial ground it's uh, quite a macabre story and it's nice just to give a few moments of uh, to pay your respects for lunch we went over to Reading Terminal Market which is a gigantic indoor market something of a local institution we actually went to what's called the Nick's which is um, world famous for their sandwich which I had the pleasure of tasting they are one of the uh, highest regarded sandwich makers in the United States. Now Philadelphia is famous for the Philly cheesesteak but Denix is very much a, a local legend for good reason. It was actually crowned the best sandwich in America in 2013 uh, which is what I'm eating. Pork with broccoli rob and provolone cheese. So definitely worth a visit. Uh, Bassett's uh, established in 1861 which is actually the nation's oldest uh, ice cream uh, seller and maker and they are very good however my personal favorite was a place called 
Capo Giro, which is an artisanal Italian gelateria. Here I am about to uh, indulge in pistachio siciliano, stracciatella and bourbon vanilla as well, I believe, somewhere in there. For dinner, uh, I didn't take my camera with me because I, I, I feel it's a little bit kind of déclassé, but we went to uh, Greg Vanick's uh, restaurant. Uh, it is an award-winning contemporary American bistro. Um, he won the James Beard Award for Best Chef, and it was absolutely to die for. So you can understand why I, I didn't bring a camera with me, uh, although I did do some uh, wrist shots with the cocktails. And shout out to my good friend James, superb barman who was actually a watch fan, and uh, he watches the show. Uh, so it was really nice to, to meet some gentry out there. Uh, shout out to you my friend thank you so much again wonderful evening uh, the following night we actually went to an oyster house i forget the name um, but it was equally uh, <laughs> as good a little less formal but um, wonderful all the same okay so day two of our little trip to philadelphia today it is absolutely roasting so i apologize about my sweaty appearance in fact it's caused me to change my watches i've left the fortress at home because I'm concerned with the sunlight uh, fading those beautiful neon hands. Um, yeah, watch addiction and, and fanaticism at a whole new level, but who, can you blame me? I'm, I'm really happy with that piece. So behind me is the Rodin Museum, and in keeping with that French style, running parallel to it, is this incredible avenue inspired by the Champs-Élysées in Paris, no doubt. And at the top of it is a place I've been dying to go ever since I was a child, the Philadelphia Museum of Art, uh, so I can finally cross it off the bucket list. Um, oh, and I've got to say, the, the architecture here, I've really been impressed by this kind of uh, neoclassical revivalism, very uh, done in a, in a quite conservative British way, which is, uh, reminds me of London, funnily enough. So now uh, I'm going to finally get a look at this incredible art museum, and then we'll talk some watches. Now, before our visit to the main attraction, for me, certainly, we stopped by the Rodin Museum. This is the largest collection of Rodin's work outside of Paris. And I was very pleased to see a beautiful reproduction of one of my favorite of his pieces, The Gates of Hell. Now, I saw the original in Paris, which I do recommend. It depicts Dante's Inferno with these tortured, um, contorted bodies writhing in pain and anguish uh, what's interesting you do see the thinker mounted in there and um, Rodin actually worked on this on and off for 37 years up until his death and I don't think it was ever completed it's a sight to behold and, and quite haunting but utterly beautiful at the same time now after our short walk we made it to finally the Philadelphia Museum of Art this splendid symmetrical ravishing building is also one of the largest art museums in the world uh, up there with the Met in New York and, and uh, the V&A in London it's certainly its size and scale and grandeur and, and, and beauty is it alone is worth the journey there and here we see the main hall and hanging from the ceiling is a, a Miro um, sculpture which was nice to see um, having lived in Barcelona as well I, um, uh, I'm a big fan of his work too and they're currently expanding it to make it even larger the space uh, is mesmerizing in fact I find the building almost as equally interesting as the art inside it was magical coming um, face to face with so many of my favorite works by uh, Dali, as you see here, uh, Suzanne, there's a there's a Canaletto, which um, if you've ever noticed in my backgrounds, that one that pops up um, in the war room occasionally. Everything from Renoir, Suzanne, Van Gogh, Degas, um, to modern stuff as well. But not only uh, art, there was a, a fantastic exhibit on, and quite fittingly, uh, English gentry, stately home, interiors and um, and of course I absolutely adored the clocks that they were on display from Tompion grandfather clocks um, and they had beautifully recreated the spaces and, and put the art amongst these recreations as if I was in some uh, landed gentry manor house back home it was magical and they have a, a vast collection of, of arms and armor um, beautiful black and steel engraved 
suits of armor, their Renaissance collection, European churches, uh, especially of Italy, is breathtaking. As you can see here, their the stained glass windows. And unfortunately, time ran out. Um, we, we stayed there for the entirety of the day. Uh, it was spellbinding and, and, and truly magical and, and a dream come true for me. I, I, I'm considering a trip going back just to uh, spend a few extra days there. Okay guys, so we are back in the hotel room after what I can only describe as, uh, well, something I will never ever forget. Amazing, amazing museum. It lived up to all my expectations. But uh, as always, I've got to talk a little bit about watches. And today I thought I'd respond to a question I get literally every time I post a video, a very important subject, and that is the first watch, your first mechanical traditional watch for under a hundred dollars. Uh, especially uh, if you're a teenager, you're just getting your first watch or you want to add something a little bit more exciting, a little bit of flair, a little bit of extra flavor to an already existing collection, or you just have a very tight uh, budget to work with. There really is one undisputed champion at a hundred dollars and I'm going to give you five reasons why the Seiko 5 is the best choice. In fact, I have one with me today. This is the SNK 809. This is my own. I bought this to review, I think last year. First of all is the price. Um, at $100 or under $100 or thereabouts, you cannot beat Seiko in terms of their in-house manufacturing. Something I've noticed whenever I look at micro brands in particular, that a comment that always comes up is, well, for several hundred dollars, I could get a Seiko that, that could, you know, is much better than that. And that is true. And that's because Seiko are able, they have the infrastructure, they have the manufacturing techniques, they have the ability to mass produce things uh, to that level at, at that uh, affordably as well. Um, they produce so many of their own parts in-house. It's quite incredible. Something usually we see in high-end, super high-end brands. Um, so that just goes to show that you're never gonna beat Seiko. The history of the Seiko 5. It was started in 1963. Seiko wanted uh, basically like the people's watch. They wanted something ultra affordable to inspire new people just getting into watches or perhaps to convert new people into the hobby of watches. You got to remember this was pre quartz days before Seiko uh, changed the whole world. Um, and that, that's another great reason is Seiko in itself has such a hugely important horological history. Uh, it, it's undeniable. Whether you, you love them or loathe them, you cannot deny their significance and, and impact on the world of horology. So the Seiko 5 is named after its five key attributes. The first of which, they wanted something affordable that was automatic. Second of all, it had to have the day, date complication in a one window, they decided the ultimate complication for an everyday watch, and it makes sense, I, I can see why they did that. Third of all, it had to have water resistance. Attribute number four was they had to have a recessed crown at the four o'clock. Now these days, it has changed a little bit. We've seen Seiko 5s with a tr more traditional three o'clock crown. And the fifth reason, it was supposed to be durable. The durability was also boosted by the fact that they were the first automatic watches from Seiko that introduced the Deer Shock, which is basically uh, their shock protection, the kind of the, the Japanese answer to the Swiss Inca block. So the history is there, you cannot deny it. Uh, it's a horological icon, it's innovative in the way that it was so affordable even to this day. It's horological innovation in that movement. These days, it's based around the 7S26, 7S25, 7, uh, 7S36, 35. But what they all have in common is this little ingenious invention of Seiko called the magic lever system. It looks a little bit like a kind of wishbone. Don't let the, the simplicity deceive you. It's incredibly ingenious. It's a very efficient way of, of bi-directional winding the, the, the watch. And in fact, it was so successful and it's so reliable that the Seiko then used the same magic lever system later on in the Grand Seiko. So it just goes to show you, and you can get all of this and this is why I love the, the SNK uh, 
809. If you turn it around, you can actually see the magic lever in there. To have the history, to have the horological uh, innovation on your wrist for, for, for you know, I, I think I paid 60 bucks for this particular one, um, is unbelievable. Also, we got to be honest, uh, if this is your first mechanical watch, you can enjoy uh, looking at that movement. Okay, it's not highly decorated, uh, dressed up, tarted to, to the nines, but if this is your first watch, you, you, it's a kind of gateway drug into the magic of a of a traditional, you know, a beating movement like a beating heart. You know, I've I've described the magic as a as a biomechanical relationship. It, it runs off your movement. There's nothing quite like uh, your first automatic watch. So you get to enjoy it, and it's just astonishing to think you can get all of this for for such uh, for such a low price. That goes back to my first point, right? Okay, my fourth reason why the Seiko 5 is king at this price range is the sheer amount of variety you have to choose from. If you want to go for a Flieger style, uh, what is this, the, the, the B style dial, there's this one obviously. If you want to go with a watch that looks like the Black Bad 50 Fathoms, they have one. If you want to have that Nautilus feel but on a hundred dollar budget, they have one. And, and the great thing is they're never quite homages, they're always got that their own little uh, twist, their own little design flair. There's countless, I mean, the amount of Seiko 5s, I could stand here all day and this video would go on for hours. The, the amount of options you have to choose from is incredible. It's very few watches. In fact, I struggle to think of, an, of a different family or, or, or range of watches that is so versatile. And that's another thing is, is you can get a dress watch, a, a dive style watch, a pilot's watch, all, you know, all at that price range. Unbeatable. My last and final point, because I see a little uh, light flashing, it means I'm running out of either battery or memory card. So I'll, I'll, I'll quickly get to it. And that's why I bought this one, is that I intended to mod it. You can make it your own. For a hundred or a couple of hundred bucks more, you can make it as crazy as you want, or as, as just a simple modification, bespoke watchmaking. I mean, usually this is a thing of, of a luxury high-end brands. I've seen some fantastic uh, versions. You really get your own unique flair and add your own little bit of personality, your own taste to the watch. There's nothing like having something made to your specifications. And I think that's just wonderful. So again, very difficult to find, very difficult to beat in a watch this uh, this inexpensive. So if you are in the market for your first watch, uh, your first mechanical watch, no matter if you're younger or older and you want to add something a little bit more fun for the weekend, the Seiko 5 is undoubtedly king for mechanical and automatic timepieces under $100. Um, and I'm going to have a lot of fun uh, modding this and to, to my own design. Anyway, guys, I'm going to leave it there, short and sweet. Uh, let me know your thoughts, queries, comments, especially your favorite Seiko 5. Uh, please add the reference in the comments below. Thank you very, very much for watching. Please don't forget to like this video if you enjoyed it. And it's goodbye from uh, fantastic Philadelphia. Okay, guys, I'll catch you in the next one. Ciao.